The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky Translated by Constance Garnett Part 1 The History of a Family Chapter 1 Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov was the third son of Fyodor Pavlovich Karamazov, a landowner well known in our district in his own day, and still remembered among us owing to his gloomy and tragic death, which happened thirteen years ago, and which I shall describe in its proper place. For the present I will only say that this landowner, for so we used to call him, although he hardly spent a day of his life on his own estate, was a strange type, yet one pretty frequently to be met with, a type abject and vicious and at the same time senseless. But he was one of those senseless persons who are very well capable of looking after their worldly affairs, and apparently after nothing else. Fyodor Pavlovich, for instance, began with next to nothing. His estate was of the smallest, he ran to dine at other men's tables, and fastened on them as a toady, Yet at his death it appeared that he had a hundred thousand roubles in hard cash. At the same time, he was all his life one of the most senseless, fantastical fellows in the whole district. I repeat, it was not stupidity. The majority of these fantastical fellows are shrewd and intelligent enough, but just senselessness, and a peculiar national form of it. He was married twice and had three sons, the eldest Dmitri by his first wife, and two, Ivan and Alexei by his second. Fyodor Pavlovich's first wife, Adelaida Ivanovna, belonged to a fairly rich and distinguished noble family, also landowners in our district, the Musovs. How it came to pass that an heiress, who is also a beauty, and moreover one of those vigorous, intelligent girls so common in this generation, but sometimes also to be found in the last, could have married such a worthless, puny weakling, as we all called him, I won't attempt to explain. I knew a young lady of the last romantic generation, who after some years of an enigmatic passion for a gentleman, whom she might quite easily have married at any moment, invented insuperable obstacles to their union, and ended by throwing herself, one stormy night, into a rather deep and rapid river from a high bank, almost a precipice, and so perished, entirely to satisfy her own caprice, and to be like Shakespeare's Ophelia. Indeed, if this precipice, a chosen and favorite spot of hers, had been less picturesque, if there had been a prosaic flat bank in its place, most likely the suicide would never have taken place. This is a fact, and probably there have not been a few similar instances in the last two or three generations. Adelaide Ivanovna Musov's action was similarly, no doubt, an echo of other people's ideas, and was due to the irritation caused by lack of mental freedom. She wanted, perhaps, to show her feminine independence, to override class distinctions and the despotism of her family, and a pliable imagination persuaded her, we must suppose for a brief moment, that Fyodor Pavlovich, in spite of his parasitic position, was one of the bold and ironical spirits of that progressive epoch, though he was, in fact, an ill-natured buffoon and nothing more. What gave the marriage piquancy was that it was preceded by an elopement, and this greatly captivated Adelaide Ivanovna's fancy. Fyodor Pavlovich's position at the time made him specially eager for any such enterprise, for he was passionately anxious to make a career in one way or another. To attach himself to a good family and obtain a dowry was an alluring prospect. As for mutual love, it did not exist, apparently, either in the bride or in him in spite of Adelaide Ivanovna's beauty. This was perhaps a unique case of the kind in the life of Fyodor Pavlovich, who was always of a voluptuous temper, and ready to run after any petticoat on the slightest encouragement. She seems to have been the only woman who made no particular appeal to his senses. Immediately after the elopement, Adelaide Ivanovna discerned in a flash that she had no feeling for her husband but contempt. The marriage accordingly showed itself in its true colors with extraordinary rapidity. Although the family accepted the event pretty quickly, and apportioned the runaway bride her dowry, the husband and wife began to lead a most disorderly life, and there were everlasting scenes between them. It was said that the young wife showed incomparably more generosity and dignity than Fyodor Pavlovich, who, as is known, got hold of all her money up to 25,000 rubles as soon as she'd received it so that those thousands were lost to her forever. 
the little village, and the rather fine townhouse which formed part of her dowry, he did his utmost for a long time to transfer to his name, by means of some deed of conveyance. He would probably have succeeded, merely from her moral fatigue and desire to get rid of him, and from the contempt and loathing he aroused by her persistent and shameless importunity. But fortunately, Adelaida Ivanovna's family intervened and circumvented his greediness. It is known for a fact that frequent fights took place between the husband and wife, but rumor had it that Fyodor Pavlovich did not beat his wife, but was beaten by her, for she was a hot-tempered, bold, dark-brown, impatient woman, possessed of remarkable physical strength. Finally she left the house and ran away from Fyodor Pavlovich with a destitute divinity student, leaving Mitya, a child of three years old, in her husband's hands. Immediately Fyodor Pavlovich introduced a regular harem into the house, and abandoned himself to orgies of drunkenness. In the intervals he used to drive all over the province, complaining tearfully to each and all of Adelaida Ivanovna's having left him, going into details too disgraceful for a husband to mention in regard to his own married life. What seemed to gratify him, and flatter his self-love most, was to play the ridiculous part of the injured husband, and to parade his woes with embellishments. One would think that you got a promotion, Fyodor Pavlovich, you seem so pleased in spite of your sorrow, scoffers said to him. Many even added that he was glad of a new comic part in which to play the buffoon, and that it was simply to make it funnier that he pretended to be unaware of his ludicrous position. But who knows? It may have been simplicity. At least he succeeded in getting on the track of his runaway wife. The poor woman turned out to be in Petersburg, where she had gone with her divinity student, and where she had thrown herself into a life of complete emancipation. Fyodor Pavlovich at once began bustling about, making preparations to go to Petersburg, with what object he could not himself have said. He would perhaps have really gone, but having determined to do so, he felt at once entitled to fortify himself for the journey by another bout of reckless drinking. And just at that time his wife's family received the news of her death in Petersburg. She had died quite suddenly in a garret, according to one story, of typhus, or as another version had it of starvation. Fyodor Pavlovich was drunk when he heard of his wife's death, and the story is that he ran out into the street and began shouting with joy, raising his hands to heaven, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace. But others say he wept without restraint like a little child, so much so that people were sorry for him, in spite of the repulsion he inspired. It is quite possible that both versions were true, that he rejoiced at his release, and at the same time wept for her who released him. As a general rule, people, even the wicked, are much more naive and simple-hearted than we suppose, and we ourselves are too. This ends chapter 1.